Tomorrow is the future. Tomorrow's actions are being formulated by what we do today, but it's not done in isolation from the past. That is what we learned yesterday is informing us as we go forward. Time and space are two amazing concepts, concepts that have befuddled humanity for centuries. They continue to perplex us, but we continue to strive to better understand them. Just about everybody in this room has lived in a time when people live in Earth orbit, where human beings move from the surface of the Earth up to Earth orbit. It's part of your everyday regime. In fact, you probably even ignore it when it's in the newspapers, when it's on television. Oh, ho-hum, they're going into orbit again. You have been a part of a time in history where Earth orbit has been continuously populated. Not by many people yet, but nonetheless, a continuous presence in Earth orbit. You have also lived at a time where going to other planets in our solar system to place spacecraft in orbit around those planets is again commonplace. As we speak, we have satellites in orbit around the planet Venus, Mars, Ju well, not quite Jupiter, next month, Sat Saturn. We've got a spacecraft that in July of this year is going to reach dwarf planet Pluto. Again, it is commonplace for you. The exploration of the solar system could appear on the front page of every newspaper, on your Facebook channels, at a moment's notice. It is a part of your life. We have had, again, for almost everybody in this room, an opportunity to explore Mars. Rovers have been on the surface of Mars continuously since 1997. You have grown up in a world where not only can we look at planets in our solar system through our telescopes. Not only can we read about them in textbooks, science and science fiction, we can actually go there and run around the surface in effectively dune buggies. The age of exploration on other planets has been a part of your life. For you, however, the moon landings were in the past. And yes, the moon landings did occur. Let's get that out of the way right now. Okay, the moon landings did occur. 45 years ago, a long time in your past. From my perspective, as I was growing up, getting excited about astronomy and space science, the moon landing was something to strive for. It was in my future. Now it is in our past. Things change with time, I guess is what I am trying to convey to you. Time does not stand still. Things move, things change. And I've got an extra slide up in front of me. That's good, okay. So, when you are looking to the future, think back to the past to give yourself a little bit of information about how best to proceed. Many of you, in fact, may well have the opportunity to play in the ultimate sandbox. You, or at least your grandchildren, might be playing on the surface of the moon, looking back towards Earth. At the moment, that's in your future, certainly in my future, but to the children who play on the surface of the moon, it will be in their past. Times change. When you think about it, the universe is full of wonders. I look into my telescope and I explore visually the planets of our solar system. They're wonderful sights. I look beyond them. I see the stars. I see the nebulae. I see the stellar nurseries, the Orion Nebula, for example. Wonderful regions inside our Milky Way galaxy that give me a great deal of satisfaction. And they, of course, give me problems because I'm trying to understand what's happening inside these objects. I look beyond the stars and the nebulae of our home galaxy, out to the realm of the galaxies. The universe is huge, it's immense, it's enormous. There are billions, tens of billions of galaxies out there, all waiting to be explored, one way or another. There are questions. There have always been questions. Trying to unravel how the universe is operating is not an easy thing. We've been at it for thousands of years. And even though we've answered some questions, for every one question we answer, other questions arise. Today, we really don't understand what dark energy is. What is dark matter? Between dark energy and dark matter, that's 95% of the energy matter balance in our universe we understand a little bit about 5% of the universe. There's an awful lot we don't understand. Are we alone? Are we the only form of life 
that exists in our galaxy, in the universe. Big questions that we are trying to grapple with and understand. But time and space are interrelated. When we start moving out into the night sky, when we start looking at objects that are further away from us, the relationship between time and distance becomes very real. How old is our universe? Our best guess at the moment, about 13.882 billion years. The further away we look from the Earth, the further back in time we are looking. You are time travelers every time you step outside and look at the night sky. Energy, information that is coming to you from every single source in the night sky is coming to you from the past. The further you can see in space, the further back in time you are traveling. Astronomers are able to piece together our past by looking further and further from the Earth because we are looking further and further back in time. Time and distance are intimately related. Okay, that might be a little hard to comprehend. 13.82 billion years of time, time and space. All right, let's go from Toronto to Sydney, Australia. You jump on a plane. It's traveling at about 800 kilometers an hour, give or take. 15 and a half thousand kilometers from here to Sydney. 20 hours of travel time. Time and distance you can appreciate. From here to Sydney, 20 hours of travel time. From here to Sydney, 15 and a half thousand kilometers of distance. All right, so let's now move out into space. The sun, when you go outside later on today and you feel the warmth of the sunlight striking your skin, realize that that energy, that information has come to you across 150 million kilometers, traveling at the speed of light, because that's what electromagnetic radiation does. It travels at the speed of light. 300,000 kilometers a second. It's taken that light that is warming your skin about eight and a half minutes to get to you. The sun is eight and a half minutes away in your past. It is history. But you receive the information and you can do with it what you want. Normally it's just to keep warm, but it's information that has come to you from the past. If you step outside tonight and you know where the constellation of Draco is, Draco the dragon, if you find a wonderful orange little star by the name of Gamma Draconis, Eltanen, it's just to the left of center on this star chart. If you look up and you see that star, realize that the light you are receiving, the information that you are receiving, left that star at the same time that Canada was going through Confederation. That was 1867, by the way. 1867, the light from El Tannen will reach you tonight. That star is 148 years in your past. And it's a relatively close star. In the last 20 years, astronomers have begun to realize that planets outside of our solar system are commonplace. It, prior to 1995, the only planets that we knew about were the eight, well, it was nine at that point in time, but it's eight planets in our solar system. In 1995, we found the first exoplanets orbiting around a sun-like star. Today, in excess of 5,000 planets, exoplanets, and planetary candidates are known. Based upon that information, astronomers are now very, very confident that every star in our galaxy has a planetary system. Exoplanets are not rare. They are very common. When you look at our galaxy, the Milky Way, this is home for us. It's a spiral galaxy, a barred spiral galaxy. It's about 100,000 light years in diameter. That means traveling at the speed of light, that was 300,000 kilometers a second, it will take you over 100,000 years to cross from one side of the Milky Way galaxy to the other. Remember I said space is big? It really is, it's true. The galaxy is huge. Within that galaxy, that beautiful spiral galaxy, 
there are somewhere in excess of a hundred billion stars. Every one of those stars, astronomers now believe, contains a planetary system, meaning that there are hundreds of billions of planets in our galaxy alone. And from that set of, set of planets, it is likely that tens of billions of those planets are Earth-like planets. Now, that doesn't mean tens of billions of Earths, and it doesn't mean necessarily tens of billions of civilizations, but it does mean tens of billions of planetary real estates where life may be able to form. When we think about life forming on the Earth, there are a very specific set of conditions that had to have existed. But without going into a lot of detail, the most important one is probably the fact that water can exist in a liquid form on our planet. For any planetary system where there is such a region, we would call that region a habitable zone. It's the Goldilocks zone where the temperature is not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right, that allows water to exist on a planetary surface. And so those hundreds of billions of planets, while they vary significantly in their variety, some are really hot, some are gas giants, some are really cold and so on, but the tens of billions of those planets that are Earth-like reside in the habitable zone. Stars, like people, vary. Some are a little hotter, some are a little cooler. If you're a little hotter, your habitable zone has to be a little further out than the Earth is with respect to our sun. If your star is a little cooler, your habitable zone is a little closer in. But the point is that tens of billions of habitable planets likely exist in our Milky Way galaxy as you and I are chatting today. Hopefully, when it comes to communicating with life. Now, you know, actually I should say that you know, life doesn't have to be macroscopic life. It doesn't have to be intelligent life. When we are looking at those exoplanets, we are looking for any sign of life. We're looking for biomarkers in their planetary atmospheres, for example. And if we find oxygen, it's a really good indication that we're talking about life at some level. And it could be microscopic life, not macroscopic life. Microscopic life is nonetheless life. It answers the question, are we alone? But more interesting is macroscopic life. Macroscopic life that may be able to communicate with us. Macroscopic life that may give rise to a sentient intelligence. It may give rise to ET if you will. Now, imagine, for just a moment, going back to that uh, star, El Tannen, over there in Draconis. We get a signal from that star, from a planet, from a civilization. So just imagine, we've got a planetary civilization orbiting that star. They sent a signal on the day of Canadian Federation. It arrives tonight. You get really excited because, gosh, you've, you've heard from ET and you transmit a message back. And I don't care what the message is. It can be high, it can be something more significant. But it's going to take 148 years for that signal to go back to El Tannen. Round trip communication, just a little bit under 300 years. That makes for a really disjointed conversation with ET. Time and distance are a huge problem when it comes to the communication with ET in our civilization, sorry, with any civilization that might exist in our galaxy. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking, but we need to be aware of this huge disjoint nature because of time and distance. I personally hope that uh, Star Trek and science fiction are right, that the ultimate speed limit, the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers a second, is not the ultimate speed. That we will be able to travel faster than the speed of light, that we will be able to communicate at speeds faster than the speed of light. But at the moment, all of our science suggests 
that the speed of light is in fact the ultimate speed limit. Now that said, it doesn't change any of our efforts to move forward. To be able to search for life across our galaxy is, to me, one of the ultimate excitements of science. To be able to answer the question of are we alone is a question that we, as human beings, have been asking for centuries, if not millennia. We are now in a position to potentially answer the question of are we alone. As I say, we may not find macroscopic life, but even finding microscopic life will definitely give rise to that excitement, that answer. From your point of view, as a potential scientist who develops the technique that is utilized to find the first extraterrestrial intelligence, from your perspective, maybe you'll be an engineer that designs the instrument that allows for that first communication with an extraterrestrial civilization. Maybe you will be a journalist who is breaking the story to the world, the first contact with an extraterrestrial. Perhaps you will be a linguist who is asked to craft the first communication with an extraterrestrial. Where will you be? Oops, that jumped a little bit. Okay, if we move that back one slide. Where will you be when science fiction meets science fact? That is a future, an exciting future, which I suspect is not very far away.